Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. For everyone listening, this is a very exciting interview for me in particular. We are here today with Beatrice Venezzi, who is a pianist, composer, and conductor with a ton of accolades. Specifically, you are the principal guest conductor of the Orchestra della Toscana, the principal conductor of the Orchestra Milano Classica, and of the Nueva Orchestra Scarlatti Young. You were appointed to the Feminine Council of Cultural Affairs by the Vatican for the triennium in 19, for 2019 to 2021. And what's incredible about you is that you are truly one of few women conductors who has international standing. Your, your reach is so far and wide, everywhere from Japan to Belarus to Portugal and Lebanon, Canada, Argentina, from the US to Armenia. And everyone listening, you know, she has collaborated with world renowned artists across the entire globe. And I am super excited to hear about your background because you have really traveled a path that is not typical. So we will get into everything. So first of all, I always like to start my interviews with understanding where you came from. So first of all, I want to, to thank you for this interview because it's such a pleasure to be here with a, such a splendid woman. So, yeah, so thank you. Well, I was born in Lucca. Lucca is a little hometown in Tuscany, uh, surrounded by ancient walls. Every, every tourist falls in love with it. And um, these roots were very important to, to me and to my uh, background, what, what became my background. Because I was born in the same hometown of Giacomo Puccini. He was born there too as well as uh, Luigi Boccherini, as well as uh, Alfredo Catalani and so many other great composers and musicians in the past. So with, those, with, with that very background, I moved then from, uh, uh, from Lucca to, to Milan to study, to finish my studies. And, uh, and, then now, and now I live in Switzerland, I live in Lugano. So this musical background influenced me, of course, on my past, on the past that I decided to, to, to take. And um, well, I started out in piano when I, when I was a kid. Actually, I come from a family in, in a, there's no musicians in my family. So there's no musical tradition in my family, apart from my dad, that, who used to, to play the, the double bass, in the, actually the electric bass, in a Led Zeppelin cover band. Oh, And that was cool. all, yes. Very was cool. Something completely different from, from myself, from, from what I decided for myself. So, so yes, I started out in piano, almost by chance because uh, there was this woman giving lessons, giving piano lessons in my elementary school and that's where I started uh, to, to love music and to, and to love that very instrument. So I decided to enroll in the, into the conservatory in my hometown in Lucca and there I started the academic path in, uh, in piano studies and uh, and then after a while I realized that piano, well, music was the right language, but piano was not enough for me to fully express myself. So I understood that I needed something more, something more complete and uh, something with, I would say, with more colors. And this instrument is the orchestra. So I decided to start studying composition first and then conducting in Florence with my first teacher, first maestro, who was Piero Bellugi. And, uh, and then from, then I, from there I went to the Accademia Chigiana in Siena and in the end in, uh, in Milan, the Conservatory of Milan, and, and that's where I finished my, my studies in conducting. So um, that's my story. So 
When you were a child though, I mean, it's pretty incredible to have your path so clear from when you were young. Like a lot of people think they want to do one thing, end up doing another, but you were so focused on that track. So you were able to really progress in that. But at the time you were growing up, did you have any female role models in that space? Because everyone you've named is Men. not. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. So, so when you were thinking about the orchestra, was there anyone you could point to as an example of who you wanted to be like? Not for conducting, actually. You're right. There's no, there's no role models, uh, no role model for uh, for uh, female conductors. I think I, I don't actually like the, this difference to point out the difference in between a female and a male conductor because I just think there are good conductors and bad conductors, and that's it. But for sure, um, we have a different body, different uh, length. Uh, of the arms, for example, a different, uh, different um, balance. So the, the organs, internal organs, are disposed in a different way, and this makes a difference in a, in such a job, which is so closely uh, related to the body and to the body expression. So that, that was actually very difficult because uh, my only uh, role, role models were, were men, actually. So can you share with us a little bit, because I obviously have no clue about what it's like to be a conductor, and I'm sure people listening also have no clue. What type of skills do you need to do this? And when you say, like, obviously I know what you mean when you say your body and your arms, but can you walk us through a little bit of what those actions do. So, let's say that uh, the right arm is mean to express what is related to rhythm. So, for example, if a piece is in two, in two and three, I'm talking about the beats, then we use different figures, different geometrical figures to express that. So two, for example, is like one, two. Three is similar to a triangle. One, two, three. Four is almost like a cross. One, two, three, four. And, and that's, of course, very, to, to make it easy. Uh, and the left hand, the left hand as a, is more related to expression. So if a phrase is legato or staccato, uh, you, you know, those are, I'm very proud of it actually. We are using Italian names for, uh, for these techniques uh, because uh, the, the, the language, the, the musical languages is still Italian. So anyway, left hand is more related to everything that is, that regards expression. If a, if a sound, for example, if I want sound to be Forte, so a big. I will use a big gesture. If it's if I want it to be piano, which is kind of small and uh, soft, then I would use a small gesture. And okay, that's of course to, to make it make it easy to understand. Yes, it's much yes. more complex than this. But anyway, of course. that's how it works. How many hours a day were you practicing? I study basically. It's a bit. Diff it's a very different. Uh, it's very different from playing an instrument, uh, because with the instrument you have your own instrument. I was. I used to be a pianist. I mean, I, I started out in piano, so I had my own instrument and I could uh, rehearse and mm -hmm. keep on training myself on that very instrument. A singer, the same way, has his its own voice, but. For the, for the conductor it's much different because you don't have an orchestra you can train on. Uh, it's, it's a lot of imagination basically. You have to read the score, get to know every line of every instrument from, from flute, from piccolo flute to double bass. And so you have to read the score both vertically because every instrument is one above the other, you know, on a line. And on the same way, on the, on the same time, uh, in the same time, you have to read it horizontally 
because that's the the tempo, the the the, uh, the time that is flowing, you know. And you have to imagine everything that is written in the in the score. So we used to um, rehearse to train ourselves by playing that very score of the orchestra of the orchestra, the entire orchestra on the piano. We we kind of do a yeah a kind of a redu reduction of that very score and we play it on the piano so to understand how it how the music develops during during its length but on the other side you have to have a, a, a great imagination to understand how it works with the orchestra how it will uh, sound actually and how you can impress your own interpretation in it because you can't change any any note nothing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can work on the balance for example balancing between different different sections or well more uh, to um, play like, with the tempos with different tempos faster slower and what's more you know whatever is piano or forte or uh, fast or slow it's different to each one of us uh, it's not a very slow, it's something for me that is, might be diff different for you. It has to deal a lot with, um, with your own, you know, sensibility. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So, I know you were saying before how, you know, you don't like to think of uh, male versus woman, but I do think it's important to note that so many women across multiple industries that are male dominated, do feel a sense of imposter syndrome when they're trying to rise through the ranks. Did that ever cross your mind? Did you ever feel like you didn't belong there? I do every day. I have <laughs> this feeling every day, actually. Really, um, and you know what? I travel a lot with my work. I was, I was in Japan. I was in Armenia, in Georgia, in, in Lebanon, even. I was in very male let's say male uh, country i would say mm -hmm. I know uh, male oriented countries male dominated right but i had a different feeling from italy i i have to say that because for example the first time i went to japan i well before leaving i wrote an email to the organizer the, the person who was organizing the the concert and um and I simply wrote, well, listen, usually I wear long dresses, female dresses, because I want you to, to express that, I want you to, to, to give the message through my art that a woman can do this job and she doesn't need to hide her being a woman. She doesn't I love that. Need, yeah, I mean, I think we, we don't need to hide our nature to, to do what is considered, historically considered, a male, um, a male job. So I explained everything during this in, in this uh, email. I explained all my reasons in a very clear way. And you know, when you you write such an email, then and in the end you ask, but if you prefer, I can wear something more traditional. You expect them to to answer you, no, of course, it's no problem. Do whatever you feel like. But the answer was no. Please wear something more traditional, something more male like. Wow. Yes, that was the that was the answer. But I didn't give up and I brought with me two um two different suits. One was a, a male one and the other was a dress. A female dress. And so I, I flew to, to Tokyo and uh, I again I started to, to explain this this subject there, which is to me very important. And in the end I won. So I wore a, a long dress and actually there was nothing they could say because the, uh, the artistic performance itself was uh, perfect. Uh, we, we had a success with the audience and whatever else. So they were, everybody was happy at that moment. And I got many calls to come back to, to work in Japan. Uh, so at, at that point, it didn't, um, there was no the, the fact that I was a woman and I was showing off that, that very aspect of, well, didn't have any weight anymore, you know, because it's very meritocratic, it's a very meritocratic 
society. But I can't say the very same here in Italy. You know, we are, we are used to think about Italy as a more modern, more, you know, uh, accustomed to, you know, equality, to gender equality country, but it's not, honestly. That's pretty incredible, and I'm really glad that you wore the dress. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you were coming through your career and obviously becoming more and more experienced, did you face any obstacles along the way that you can share? Well, um, you know, what it was very difficult to me uh, it is still the fact that I'm, I'm both a woman and I'm young and I'm showing that I'm a woman and also, and especially that, the, the fourth one, I want to, to work on divulgation of classical music because I think this, this subject has to reach everybody, every one of us uh, deserves the, the right of, of understanding what classical music means. So, um, and this is something that some, let's say, some word uh, related to the academy, uh, to conservatories, for example, or whatever else, they, well, they don't like it at all. Because there's this idea of classical music that has to be just for those who understand it. And so this is, um, this is something that I faced that was, yeah, that, that was some, that was something that was an obstacle because um, I was thinking in the beginning that you know this mission of bringing classical music to everybody was something shared, something shared by my colleagues as well. But it's not. So how did you tackle that? Like what, what steps did you take to sort of make it available to everyone and make it like, no, this is, this is my goal, this is what I'm doing? Well, um, for example, the way I use my socials, social medias, I try to, um, to bring people into my life. I never bring anything too private. Uh, I never post anything too private in, uh, in my social medias, but always more or less always related to my job mm -hmm. so to bring those people uh, into my world and the world of classical music therefore so um, this is a way to make people come closer to this subject as well so That's first true. of all the way i communicate and i talk about classical music i'm very present on media in general and this is not common for a, for a musician of classical music honestly Especially, I repeat, in this country, not in Italy. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's something, you know, if you get accustomed to, to, to something, then it becomes some kind of, somehow, normal. Yes, for sure. That's a great way to tackle that, actually. And that's what you're saying. Then I wrote a book, which is called oh. Allegro con poco. It's coming up in my questions. Okay. I've got that covered. How do you want to inspire other women to follow in your path? And is it important to you to have more women come into your field? I think so. And I think um, conducting is something that stands for so many other uh, positions. So being a conductor is being a leader, means being a leader, basically. And we do not have so many great women in, in leading positions. I mean, there are CEOs, uh, of course, um, there are many, in, well, we have an astronaut, from a famous uh, Italian female astronaut, for example, but we don't have so many examples, for example, in politics or in other fields. And, and conducting has a lot, to with, has a lot to do with uh, with politics as well, because you know it, you don't just have to lead the music; you have to lead people. Yeah, uh, you have to uh, conduct those people. You have to put them together, show them the goal, the, the shared goal, what should be the shared goal, 
and and bring them there and convince them to follow you. So that, that has a lot to do with uh, with leading people, even more than leading music, you know. So I think women really really need to um, to understand the importance of networking and to create a net of people of, of, of women actually working together sharing ideas sharing experience mm -hmm. yes and i'm um, every every girl who's writing me well actually also also boys not just not just girls but anyway it's writing me by through the social media, uh, asking for suggestions or whatever else, and I always reply because I, I like to help. Tell us a little bit about what you want your music to convey, and when you think about sort of your personal brand, like what is your style? Wow, in music? <laughs> it's um, well, I repeat, I think the. the Key word to me is communication. Okay, um, that's very important to me because through communication, well, music is a language, and music itself is communication. And through music, you can reach different layers of population, mm -hmm. different uh, cultures as well. So I think communication is the the key word to me, and um, a, a more Friendly user, uh, yeah, well, yeah, sorry, user friendly, a more user friendly attitude is what I want to bring into classical music. Yeah, you know what? As you say that, and and thinking about what you just said about your social media, it it can be very intimidating because there is an element of I don't want to say snobbery, but it, it's, it it's is. definitely. It is. It, Okay, so then fine. There, there's an element of you have to be very intellectually curious to sort of experience that. And if you're not educated on the musicians and, and on the importance of these pieces, then you're not worthy in a way. Well, I fight this completely. I fight this idea because it's not true that you have to understand music before listening to it. Classical music, of course. It's, it's classical music is music, and you just have to enjoy it first of all, and that's the very first step. You know, just to be curious, to to get curiosity towards this subject, and to just to listen, to enjoy it. Yeah. And then, of course, it's such a complicated matter. It's it's very complicated. I can't hide it. But there are so many layers. You can go deep into these layers. But I repeat it, first of all, you just have to enjoy it. I think that's great advice. Do you listen to other types of music as well? Of course, of course I listen to nearly everything. Yeah, I like very much some great rock, you know, and also some uh, electronic music, yes. Interesting, yeah. interesting. What is it like and what does it mean to you to be one of the first women in international standing in this role? Well, it's a great honor and it's a great, on the other, on the other way around, it's a great weight on my shoulders because um, you are always under pressure. You know, the, everybody is waiting for me to fail. That, Do you that's think that's true? The, uh, that, that's true? The, well, um, that's the the, um, the the feeling. Yeah, the feeling. Thank you very much. That's the yeah. feeling I have. But that's just that's not related today to the audience, of course. That's related to the colleagues, you know, the academic field. Because, uh, of course, I'm saying things that are not accepted. So that classical music, for instance, has to be for everybody, or that a woman should not hide herself in, in being a conductor. Uh, so, um, those are fights, really fights, and therefore every, every one of the uh, in, inside of that very field is just waiting for that. And what's more, you know, it's very, being a conductor, there are so, so less 
spaces for conductors, so less positions for conductors. Mm -hmm. uh, so so many orchestras, but so many, um, but too many conductors for those orchestras. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of competition in this world. So, um, but anyway, it's a great honor for sure. What is a typical day in your life? You can do before pandemic, a normal day in your life, <laughs> not this second. <laughs> well, there's no routine. That, that's something I love about my work, that there's no routine. So there's no um, a typical day because it depends, it changes a lot. Uh, if it's a day in which I'm home and I'm studying or I have phone calls, emails, the back office stuff or I'm free or uh, I'm working in the theater, uh, so in a theater. And so if it's a rehearsal day, for instance, uh, I wake up, I go to the theater and stay there the whole day, conducting, rehearsing, speaking with singers, orchestra, um, artistic director, whoever else. And then of course interviews and, uh, and all that price, uh, kind of press work. But there's no, I, that's in fact the point, there's no routine, there's no typical day. Wow, that's crazy that's a, to me. Well, the constant is that there's a lot of study. Because I'm always studying, I'm always studying new scores for new concerts. Um, it's so huge, I mean the repertoire is so huge that you have to study a lot. <laughs> how, how many concerts do you do a year, do you think? Oh, uh, 50, I think. And how many countries does that amount to, do you think? I don't know, 15 countries, I would say, something like that. Wow. What do you do to relax? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the other thing is that, of course, you have the day of the concert, but you have three, four, five days or a month of rehearsals before that. And so it's, it, it's more about the rehearsals than, than the performances themselves. And what do I do for relax, to relax? Well, I do yoga, practice yoga. Okay. I like to walk a lot, possibly into wood, into, into the nature. Here where I live in Lugano, in Ticino, it's full of wonderful mountains with stunning views. And you can walk. Uh, there's a lot of um, path you can take and do so. Sounds so nice. Yeah. What what inspires you today? Well, in these very days, I'm very inspired by by Rudolf Steiner anthroposophy. I'm reading a pretty a lot of his books and mm. um, the texts of his conferences. And yeah, that's a new humanist that is very interesting to me. And it's human beings in the very center of everything. And I think we do need that in this very moment. We do need to put again, we, we need to come back to sort of renaissance and to a sort of, well, renaissance idea of a man as a, a human being as a microcosmos inside a macrocosmos. So, so, to, so to feel, so, um, how shall I put that? So to to be in absolute contact with the cosmos. So this is very, I find this very inspiring in these days. I think a lot of people right now are very comforted by learning. I think there's a lot of learning going on in all different fields, which I think is, is really important. Is there anything that scares you? Well, when I see, for, for instance, in this period, the fact that, of course, so many concerts were canceled, I'm not used to stay home and do nothing. I'm sure. I'm, I'm totally not used to that. So that was, that was quite hard to me, and uh, and that was my great fear actually to to be home with nothing. Of course, uh, I, I made it to do so many things. I learned as well. I studied Spanish, and 
<laughs> I read books, I practiced yoga, I learned new scores and whatever else. So it's not true that I did nothing, but the idea of it, you know, it makes me feel like I'm, I'm losing my balance totally. So, uh, well, you're not alone. I think, yeah. that, have you done any virtual concerts? Yes, two actually. Uh, How were they? How were well, they? It's very difficult because, you know, as I said, the main thing in conducting is the human contact. And um, when you're missing it, then you're missing a great part of the job. Yeah, that was hard, but it was very nice to, to give it as a gift, to give these videos as gifts to, to our public, to our audience. That's so nice. So, in April 2019, you decided to write a book. Yes. And tell us what made you want to do that and tell us a little bit about it. So, it's a, again, um, the book is, is about divulgation of this great subject that I love so much, which is classical music. In fact, the, 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 the title is Allegro con Foco, which is a, a way of describing music. Let's say, um, and yes, an indication for um, for some pieces. Let's say, and after that is innamorarsi della musica classica. So how to fall in love with classical music? Because my aim was to uh, well inspire people to become curious about this, mm -hmm. um, about classical music and to and of course to fall in love with it. It's subdivided into five chapters in five yes uh, areas I would say uh, five themes and the one I love the most is the, the third one um, and the fourth they're talking about theater how a theater works so the, the third is a safari in, into a theater what happens into the pit into the orchestral pit what happens mm -hmm backstage what does a conductor do and stuff like this and then in the next chapter i pick some i decided to pick actually five uh, plots of five operas and to to explain why they are so actual so uh, modern even nowadays uh, why they're still uh, speaking the language of modernity and um, so that was very interesting even for me to write it because i had to find the links to to express to fully express this so i hope i made it i'm sure you did and i'm so glad i did not attempt to say that title because i would have killed it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have been recognized in your industry with several major awards what does it mean to you and how do you think these awards also influence the younger generation of people coming up behind you well, again, it's the great fathers, and on, on the same at the same time, great weight on my shoulders because I have to demonstrate that I really deserve these titles and, and these prizes, and, um, and and also I feel the moral um, duty to uh, to give something to the others, so to give back what I received, and that's what I am actually trying to do with the younger generations, as I said. Everybody who has asking me any kind of tip mm -hmm. or whatever, I, I, try, I do my best to, to do it for them. And, well, for example, in these days, next, well, in a few days, next week, yes, um, I decided to give a bursary and a honorarium to... Um, to young talents, to two young talents of my region of Tuscany. So there was a competition for that. And wow. so many boys and girls of my region decided to, to send their, uh, their videos and uh, to show oh, cool. me their talents. And so I'm very proud of that. That's amazing. Have you ever conducted an orchestra or did a big event and afterwards felt like, oh, that just didn't go well. And what, yes. how do you come back from that? Like, how do you, I mean, I understand when you say 
this weight on your shoulders because when you're in the top of your game, it's really, it's stressful. It's really yeah. stressful. So how do you sort of talk yourself back? Because I would imagine you leave that night and you're like feeling down, but then you, but you have to pick yourself back up. So what do, what do you do to do that? So on one side, well, I'm never happy about any performance. <laughs> there, there's always a farther step I could reach and I didn't. But anyway, maybe that's that's the secret to to you know to keep engaged. To, yes. Yes. Uh, no. Actually, and, that's the secret to success because yeah, you're correct. <laughs> so that's the first. Th th that's the way I start. Let's start from here. And after that, well, I always I, I'm try to be I try to be very honest with myself. And I actually, I work on myself by filming myself during the performances and then I watch those performances after and that's, that brutal. kills you, that brutal. kills you. It's brutal. Really. Yeah. Um, but, on, you know, you, you find something you did better than last time, then you find something yes. worse, and something you have still, you still have to improve, or some new gesture maybe that you find, wow, and you say, okay, that's interesting, maybe I can use it again. So, um, I try to, to see everything as a path to, uh, you know, enhance my, my, uh, my knowledge and my um, uh, and the way I handle the, the conducting technique. I am going to guess that you're a really tough critic. Yes, I am. When you watch those videos. <laughs> Have you ever heard, I, it's funny, I was interviewing yesterday a photographer, a fashion photographer. Mm -hmm. and she's very well known in her field and she told me that she recently went to a critique class and I said what is a critique class and it's a class with like seven like world famous photographers wow. that basically show each other their work and then do constructive feedback to each other have you ever would you ever do something like that have you ever heard of something like that I would do um, I would love to do it and to do it actually I'm not sure if you know, when everybody's in the same field, where the, the feedback can be so constructive. You know, I'm not totally sure about that. Well, it's interesting because I will say that you're right. They're, they're photographers in totally different genres. So maybe yeah. musicians in totally different genres. But, but having that sensibility of, mm -hmm. of, of the appreciation for the art. Anyway, I thought it was so cool because yeah. I had never heard of it. <laughs> I would love to do that. I think, you know what, you can make your own, you can invite whoever you want. <laughs> what, do you, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started out? To say no, I don't accept that. You know, when you are young, you just want to have some opportunities. I'm not, I'm not talking about anything sexual, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I, I didn't even think you were, don't worry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, when you're young, you just want to have some, some opportunities and, and so you, for example, you accept to do some concerts with, with no rehearsals because there's no money to pay the rehearsals or, you know, stuff like that. And in the end, of course, you gain some experience, which is very important, especially in the beginning. But um, there's some, I realize there are some uh, things you can't accept. It's a very peculiar word, this one. I mean, the, the, the one of, of classical music. And there are so many, you know, balances you have to keep sometimes because maybe the singer was um, was called uh, to come to do the production by, you know, the main sponsor or, uh, you know, it's full of stories like this every time. Yeah. And I understood that it's very important to me to say, no, I don't accept this because uh, I know how much I worth and, uh, and how much my work worth. So um, that's something I wish I, I wish I knew when I was younger, but anyway, yeah. better later than, that, than never. I know you raise a great point. And I think that is something that you can only really recognize when you've already made it through the career.
it is hard. I mean, it's, it goes back to the old saying, like, how do you get experience when you have no experience, right? Everyone wants you to have experience. No one wants to give you experience. So I think, you know, people shouldn't beat themselves up about sort of saying yes to things maybe that they shouldn't have because mm -hmm. you learn from every experience no matter what, right? What would you advise women um, who are trying to break into industries today that mm -hmm. are sort of really atypical for females to be in? Because there, there are still many, unfortunately. Yeah, totally. Well, um, you know, my, my thought is very peculiar, as I said. <laughs> so, first of all, find, I mean, I do believe that he, the very first thing is to find the right uh, feature. Hmm. Hmm. You know, there is a difference in, in, in Italian between saying maestro and insegnante. Uh, maestro is somebody who's not just teaching you something, is keeping the best out of you and showing it to you. That's your plus. And then you have the, and then you have the, the teacher who's just teaching you and putting you some notions, some putting some notions inside you. And I think it's very important to find uh, somebody who's capable to show you what, what are your plus. And and that's not easy, especially into the conservatories, into into this environment, because it's so personal. It's so. Uh, related to the to the single personality, um, mm -hmm. so I'm not just teaching you how to play the piano. I'm teaching you how I would interpret that very piece on the piano. You know, and this is not correct to me to in into the educational process. So it's very important to find someone who's really willing to educate you. That's a great point, and also someone who has your best interest at heart, right? Because there is so much competition. And, and then there's a second thing I would like to say. Because um, when you're studying the, into the conservatory, um, generally what they tell you is that, okay, you're good. If you're very well prepared, if you're very talented, then the opportunity will come to you. Mm. It will not ever happen. So um, to be uh, the first Impresario, the first manager of yourself, that's very important. So you raise a great point. So you're saying that you have to pursue opportunities and be proactive. Totally. Totally. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. What is your life mantra? Oh. <laughs> Ricordati di osare sempre. So remember, you, you always have to uh, there, mm. you know, it, it, it's not, doesn't mean you have to overdo something you can't really do. I'm not talking about this. I'm, I'm saying that you have also always to, to exit your comfort zone and push your boundaries. That, that's, that's the way to reach something, to reach some success. I so agree. How do you ultimately want to leave your mark? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, um, in this moment, I realized, in this very period, I mean, during the lockdown, I realized that something is missing to this industry. A new way of conceiving uh, theaters, of conceiving the live performances for classical music. I think this is something um, I'm, as for me, I want to work on that. I want to propose new formats so mm -hmm. that I can reach all, really, all layers of population. So it's not just about the art itself, music itself. It's about the way, again, you communicate that and you create something that, well, what is now, nowadays called edutainment, you know, it's mm -hmm. a way of educating through entertainment. And that's something I want to uh, work on. And I think that can be, you know, my, my next level, my, uh, something that I can leave to others. I think that's wonderful. 
Well, it was such a pleasure talking to you and hearing all about your incredible career. I mean, it's really inspiring, especially for me, because it's so foreign to me. Your world is so foreign to me because obviously I never experienced it except by attending a concert. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. Thank you so much for this interview. It was a, a really a great pleasure to, to talk to oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Pleasure.